Last Sunday, we lit the candle of peace. We light it and the candle of hope again as we remember that Christ, who was born in Bethlehem, will come again to judge the world and bring it everlasting peace. So light to it. The third candle of Advent is the candle of joy. When the angel Gabriel told Mary that a special child would be born to her, she was filled with joy. She sang a song that began with the words, My soul magnifies the Lord, my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Just as the birth of Jesus gave great joy to his mother, so his presence in the world gave great joy to those who had, who had none before. He healed them and gave them hope and peace when they believed in him. From hope, peace, and love grows joy. We light the candle of joy to remind us that when Jesus is born in us, we have joy, and that through him there will be everlasting joy on earth. Joy is like a light shining in a dark place. As we look at this candle, we celebrate the joy we find in Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for this Christmas season and for its reminders of hope and peace and joy. And we pray this morning that your spirit of joy would be especially present here, that you would help lift our hearts, help lift our minds towards you, that we would be able to uh, lay aside the cares of this world even just for a while and experience all the joy that this Christmas season brings, the joy that the birth of the Christ child brings to our hearts and the change that brings in our lives. And so Lord, we just uh, pray that you bless this time together. And that something will be done this morning that would last for eternity. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Number 104. This has not been a happy week for our town. And in that mindset, it's been strange to be thinking about putting together um, a service that focuses on joy because maybe that's not where people are at this week. This week, um, our town, people in our town have been, you know, some more closely than others, some from a distance, been following um, the pain that, that some families in town have been dealing with connected to the accidental death of a young boy and the long road ahead of recovery for his sister. And, you know, there's more than one family that's grieving and dealing with how things will never be the same as they were. So I've been kind of struggling with that a bit this week. Um, thinking about, you know, how do you, how do you celebrate joy when, when people are hurting so much? It seems almost a little bit insensitive. And it wasn't until yesterday that I actually found the words that I was looking for. I found two sentences in, uh, in the, a transcript of the eulogy that the young boy's dad delivered at his funeral. And these two, this is a family of faith, as I understand it, I don't know them all, but I understand that they are a family of faith. And these two sentences in the, in the eulogy just hit me so hard. He said, Nice try, darkness. You can only gather around us. You can't come in. Nice try, darkness. You can only gather around us. You can't come in. So we have lit a candle of hope because our hope is a person. And that person has a plan to heal and comfort creation, starting with the human heart and spreading throughout the universe. We have lit a candle of peace because although in his plan I have work to do. It's his strength, not mine, that will bring it to fulfillment. And today, we light a candle of joy. And 
that candle of joy reminds us that whatever gathers around us, whatever is still wrong and broken in the world, however long it takes for that healing and comfort to be complete, his joy is a light that fights the darkness. It's not like the sun that shines on us from somewhere far away. It is a light that burns within us, quietly, deep down inside, where the darkness can't come in. So because we don't have the words on the screen, I'm going to ask you to repeat after me. We light this candle because, because we live in joy. We, live in joy. we wake every day, we every day. Knowing, what God has promised. knowing what God has promised. That the Lord will comfort his people. The Lord the Lord will comfort his people. people. That he will make the desert into a garden. The the desert 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 garden. garden. So we light this candle. Because, because we live in joy. He's promised that his people will come home singing. That they will be crowned with endless joy. That they will be crowned with endless joy. So we light this candle. Because, because we live in joy. This is what he has promised. <coughs> and his promises will be kept. His promises will be kept. We light this candle. Because, because we live in joy. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel. passage we're going to look at is from Isaiah chapter 9, starting at verse 2, and it says, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep dark darkness, a light has dawned. We have in, you have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of the oppressor. Every warrior's boot lived, used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing it and holding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for inspiring people centuries ago to put your words to music, that was songs that would last um, for centuries. We just ask, Lord God, that you would uh, speak to us through your words, speak to us through these words, that you would do a work in our hearts and lives. And Lord, I pray that you would please give me the strength to do this and take this time it's yours. Do whatever you'd like with it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So the second one's not going to go at all then, you don't think? Oh, okay. All right. Can somebody turn the lights on that, like behind here that were on before so I could see the sermon a little better? Oh, it is on? Okay, never mind, Phyllis. Thanks. Does that work? No. I'm not feeling too well this morning, so I'm going to sit down while I share this, if that's okay. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. This is the story of the Christmas season. 
that the world would be changed forever by what would appear on the outside to be the most unlikely of circumstances, a baby born in a manger, a baby born for a specific purpose, des designed from the dawn of time, a baby given as a gift. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Why was this child given? Who is this child given to? Isaiah tells us that he is given to the people walking in darkness. At one time or another, that includes all of us. Christ has come to a world walking in darkness. When we walk in darkness, our lives suffer from a lack of direction. We don't know where we're going in the dark because every direction looks exactly the same. No one choice seems better or worse than another, so it really doesn't matter to us which choice we make if we're walking in darkness. In the dark, the long-term or even the short-term consequences of our choices can't be seen, so, so the thought of consequences never even comes into our decision-making. We just kind of launch out into the darkness and do whatever seems right. When we walk in darkness, we can't see any other alternatives. A better choice, a better way to live might just be just out there, just beyond, within our grasp, but, but we would be completely oblivious to it because the darkness surrounds us. We assume that our present experience is the only way to live. And in that condition, some people will become arrogant, figuring, well, my way is the best way. It's the only way to, to live because it's the only way that I can see and experience. Claiming to be wise, we have instead become fools. And in that condition of not being able to see any alternatives, some others will lose hope, living under the weight of groping in the dark and, and finding nothing but utter futility. In the dark, we can't begin to imagine that there might even be a better way to live. When we walk in darkness, we can't think clearly. Our thinking becomes clouded. There's, there's nothing to to stimulate our minds, everything's dark. Nothing to inspire our imaginations, to spark creativity, and life just becomes dull and boring. Same old, same old. The scope of our thinking is extremely limited. There is nothing in our world beyond what our senses can experience. And in the dark, what is, what is tangible, what we can feel, what we can touch, that takes precedence over anything else that we can see. So if it feels good, then we do it, unaware of or unconcerned for the consequences. Our reality becomes only the immediate when we're in the darkness. We cannot see the future in the dark. We cannot see reason or purpose for what's going on around us. And we cannot see the hand of God at work. We can't even imagine that, that there might even be a God alive out there in the darkness. We lose faith because it is never exercised. We come to trust only in ourselves and in what we can sense and feel and hold. As humans, we still have that inherent need to worship something, but and in the dark, in the absence of knowledge of anything bigger than ourselves, anything beyond our reach, we come to worship ourselves and worship the elements of our surroundings. And God is not brought into the picture when we walk in darkness. Does this paint the picture of what it's like when the world, the world in darkness, when we may have once walked in darkness? When we walk in the darkness, we are constantly stumbling over that which we cannot see, and it's frustrating. And every time we think we are standing, every time we are convinced we finally have our act together, we stumble and we fall. Because we are in the dark, we have no idea what it is that made us stumble. Consequently, we, we just can't learn from our mistakes. We will just keep stumbling over the same thing over and over again. We have no sense of being able to avoid the same pitfalls next time. So we make the same mistakes over and over again, stumbling around in the, in the darkness, drawn to achieve some purpose, and yet having no idea really what that purpose is. And when we live in darkness, we live in fear. 
not knowing if the next step will be on firm ground or on shaking ground, never knowing what is nearby to cause us to stumble or what's just beyond our grasp to knock us down, never knowing what's around the next bend, never knowing if we are alone or, or if there are others around us in the dark just beyond our reach, and never knowing if those others are friend or foe, never knowing if our next move will be our last. When we walk in darkness, there are times when light tries to break in. But because darkness is all we've known, it's hard to comprehend the light. The light opens up a whole new world that, though it is a world we were created for, it's a world that can seem daunting and even frightening. Yes, what we see in the light is beautiful, and it compels us to, to move out and to explore, but, but frankly, the darkness is more comfortable. The darkness is easier to understand, and for that reason, so many people decide to stay in the darkness. And when we walk in the darkness, the light can be painful, like someone shining a flashlight in your eyes at midnight, and we kind of recoil from the light. We aren't used to it, and it hurts at first, and that's because light exposes. Light forces us to admit that we have no idea what we're doing. We have no idea where we're going. Light forces us to admit that we've made mistakes. Light will expose our future mistakes. <clears throat> Rather than face being exposed, we demand that the flashlight be turned off and we retreat into our comfortable darkness. And we do all these things because we don't understand the light. Light has shone in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. But unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given to bring light into our world, into our individual worlds, to help us understand and embrace the light, to help us walk in the light in every aspect of our lives. First John 1 John 1.5 tells us that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. 1 Peter 2.9 says that we are a chosen people called out of darkness, into his wonderful light. In the light of the Christ child, we receive guidance. We receive direction. The word becomes a lamp unto our feet and a light into our path. And we can see the pitfalls around us and we can avoid the things that are gonna make us stumble, things that'll knock us down and get us off track. The light helps us to see the immediate, but it also gives us a glimpse of the long term. The light helps us see the consequences of our actions, giving us wisdom to avoid certain things, wisdom in our decision-making. In providing direction, the light helps us to see our purpose. We can see God's hand at work around us, and we develop faith in his goodness and in his power. And in the light of the Christ child, we are able to think clearly. Clouded and futile thinking is brushed aside as we live in the light of God's reality. No longer are we left to try to, you know, figure things out for ourselves in the dark. Now we can see things as they really are. No longer are we left to simply accept life as it is and assume, well, that, that's all there is because I can't see anything more than that. We assume that life can't get any better. Now we can see all the amazing alternatives that God has given us that surround us. Now we can see that there is a better way to live. In the dark, our reality was so limited. In the light of the Christ child, we see reality for what it is. We see what it is that we were created for, to worship God, not to worship God's creation, and to accomplish God's good purposes for our lives, purposes that work all things out for our good and for his glory. And in the light of the Christ child, fear is driven out. In that light, we understand that we've not been given a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. The unknown becomes known. Fear of the unknown just evaporates. And even things which are known and which are daunting are, are no longer troublesome as our anxiety disappears in the light of God's peace. Fear of our enemy, the devil, disappears, for in the light we see him for who he is. See, the enemy loves the dark. His deeds love the dark, for in the dark he can make himself bigger than what he really is. 
In the dark, his deeds go unnoticed and undetected. In the dark, he can exert control by playing on our fears and playing on our anxi anxieties. But in the light, we can see the enemy for who he really is. And when he tries to bluster and bully, and he tries to play on our worries and our anxieties, we can look at him in the light see who he really is, and say, with, say to him with confidence, without fear, ah, pff, it's only you. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given to bring us light in the darkness. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given to bring us joy. The angels proclaimed to the shepherds that they were bringing good news of great joy to everyone. In the passage in Isaiah that we read, the joy provided by the child that is born is compared to the joy felt at two different events. The first is the joy felt when people in an agrarian society would bring in the harvest. Now, a beautiful harvest brings joy to the community. Sorry. They know that through the harvest, their needs will be met and they'll be taken care of through a long winter. They know that they can sell their harvest, and through the proceeds from the harvest, their other needs will be taken care of. They know that well, the, the weight and the worry and the concern is lifted, and the harvest brings a great joy that floods in. They know that they will have all that they need to stave off hunger and be filled. Unto us is born a child to bring us joy in knowing that we are taken care of, that he will supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory, to know that he will never leave us and he will never forsake us, that we have never seen the righteous forsaken, the scripture says, or his seed begging for bread. We have, known, we have joy in knowing that in the Christ child, our biggest need, our one biggest need is taken care of, and that's our need for salvation our need for forgiveness of sins, our need to, to have our sins taken care of so that we can be reconnected with God, our Father and Creator. First Peter 1 tells us that we are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy, for we are receiving the goal of our faith, the salvation of our souls. The second event Isaiah refers to is the joy warriors feel after winning a battle. In, in the Christ child, Satan has been defeated. Easter begins at the manger. As warriors sense a joy and a relief at having won the battle and no longer, longer having to fight and die, we too can know joy and relief in the fact that Christ has won the battle and he has died in our place. He has won the battle for our souls. And even though the enemy in his stubbornness refuses to give up, we have joy in knowing that Christ by his Holy Spirit fights for us daily to help us live victoriously and to mold us into God's image. In our weakness, we can know that the joy of the Lord is our strength, Scripture tells us. In our times of sadness, we can sing for joy to the Lord our God. In our times when darkness tries to creep back in and we aren't sure of what the next step is, we can be confident that God has made known to us the path of life giving us fullness of joy in his presence and eternal pleasures at his right hand. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given to bring us a deep and indescribable joy. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given to bring us freedom. In verse 4 of our passage, Isaiah compares the victory of Gideon at Midian to the freedom that is experienced in the light of the Christ child. And it first says that it shatters the yoke that burdens them. Now, a yoke is an instrument that is placed around the neck and shoulders of a farm animal, like an ox, so that the animal can be tied to the plow or to a carriage behind them. And, and once the animal is in that yoke, the animal really has no choice as to what he's going to do. He's guided by whoever's driving the team, and his sole purpose is to pull that heavy weight that's dragging behind him and that's attached to him by this yoke. The yoked animal is completely at the mercy of the one who's driving the carriage or the plow. The animal has no choice but to follow the master's directions and orders. 
And as humans, sin has become our default master. We were born that way. And we are yoked to our sinful nature and left with little choice but to follow its whims and its desires. But the Christ child has come to break the power of sin that ties us to our old master. We're no longer yoked, no longer compelled. We don't have to follow the path of our sinful nature. We are free. And our lifetime task, our lifetime fight as we grow in Christ is to remain free and not to allow ourselves or the enemy to put that yoke of slavery back on our shoulders. Galatians 5.1 tells us it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. In Christ we are free of the yoke of sin. We are daily tempted to, to take that yoke back onto our shoulders because there is pleasure for sin, in sin for a season. And Satan likes to dress up an ugly yoke so that it looks like a beautiful necklace or a nice scarf. But in the light of Christ, we see it for what it really is, a yoke of slavery. Don't take it back because it's already been shattered to pieces by the Christ child. Not only is it described as a yoke, but second, our freedom is depicted as having the heavy burden taken off of our shoulders. The weight of our sin, yes, that's taken off of our shoulders, but also the weight of our cares and our worries and our fears and our anxieties, they're all taken off of our shoulders and laid onto the shoulders of Christ. He calls to all of us who are weary and burdened and heavy laden, and his promise is to give us rest. And now, he does give us a yoke in a sense, a burden to carry, but scripture says that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Instead of trying to carry around that yoke of slavery that ties us to our sin and weighs us down, he gives us instead a yoke of service that, we're, that we were created to carry, to be able to serve others and serve him. And he walks with us so we don't carry that alone. Thirdly, Isaiah says that our freedom is depicted as having removed the rod of the oppressor. In the Christ child, the oppression of the enemy is removed. The enemy of our souls is always, always trying to oppress us, always trying to beat us down, always trying to accuse us, wag a finger in our face, try and convince us that we're, we're somehow still under his thumb and we have no chance for escape. But the truth is that Jesus came to release the oppressed. And that's a key element in what Jesus was kind of like Jesus' mission statement in Luke 4. He said, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind and to set the oppressed free. Psalm 9.9 tells us that the Lord is a refuge for the oppressed and a stronghold in the time of trouble. Like the Christmas carol says, I think it's O Holy Night, it says, Chains shall he break, for the slave is our brother, and in his name all oppression shall cease. We are freed from the oppression of the enemy through the Christ child. The words used to describe the yoke and the burden and the oppressing rod in Isaiah encourage us of the completeness of the freedom that Christ offers. They're not simply removed from us, but the, the passage says they're shattered, they're broken, they're rendered useless. For he whom the sun sets free and she who the sun, sun sets free is free indeed. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given to give us overcoming freedom. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given to bring us peace. Verse 5 of our passage tells us that every warrior's boot and every garment blood-soaked from war would be burnt up in the fire. There's, there is no more need of them in the future, no need to remember the pain they symbolize from the past, for the Christ child has come to be the Prince of Peace, the one who will bring peace, peace on earth and goodwill, goodwill to all people. Ultimately, we, we can be confident that the Christ child will bring, bring peace to the whole world. For there is coming a day when the lion will lay down with the lamb, when our swords will be beaten into plowshares and war will be no more. But for now, God has given us, given his creatures free will. And sometimes that free will will be used to fight and to destroy. 
And peace sometimes can be hard to see when we look on the outside. But through the Christ child, we can have peace on the inside, a peace that's calm and trusting in the midst of the turmoil that might surround us. Story is told of a painting contest where people were invited to paint a picture that would describe peace. And amidst all the paintings of sunsets and rainbows and flowers and oceans, there was one painting that stood out from the rest. It depicted, depicted a dark, gloomy sky with rain falling almost sideways and lightning flashing. And from the side of a mountain cliff came this tree that kind of grew out of the side of the mountain. And sitting in the tree was this nest. And sitting in this nest were a bunch of little chicks. And the mother had the chicks covered with her wings, protecting the chicks from the storm that was outside. The artist was looking at the world from the point of view of these chicks. And in that, found a depiction of what real peace was all about. Peace amid all the turmoil of life. Scripture says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, make your requests known to God. And the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Psalm 29, 11 promises us, the Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. It's a peace that may not always make sense given the circumstances. It's a peace that may be difficult to even describe or put into words, but it is a peace that God promises us. And it's made available to us through the gift of the Christ child. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given to bring us indescribable and much, much needed peace. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. He has come to bring light in the darkness, to bring joy instead of sorrow and hopelessness, to bring freedom instead of slavery, to bring peace in the midst of the turmoil. And verse 7 in our passage tells us that the zeal of the Lord will accomplish this. Now, zeal isn't a word we use a whole lot anymore. To do something with zeal means that we do something with passion and with enthusiasm and with intensity and with eagerness. And you need to know this morning, you need to know this Christmas, that God your Father is zealous for you. God your Father is passionate about you. He is passionate about who you are, passionate about working in your life, to help you become the person that you were created to be. He is enthusiastic about you. He is your biggest fan. He's your biggest cheerleader. And he loves you, and he watches over you with an intensity that cannot be compared. And he is eager. He is eager to be involved in your life, eager to be the center of your life, and to share with you all that he is. How do I know this? Well, because unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. In his passion to bring us light, to help us find our way in life and live clear-minded lives without fear, he sent his son at Christmas. In his enthusiasm to share with you the intimate relationship of joy that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit already share in the Trinity, he sent his son at Christmas. In his intense desire to, to see you free, and to break the bondage of sin and anxiety over your life, he sent his son at Christmas. And in his eagerness to bring you peace and to see your mind and heart at rest so that you can enjoy all that he has for you in this life, he sent his son at Christmas. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Would you pray with me, please? Father, thank you for working this plan out, working out this plan of Christmas, which was planned from the beginning, that you would send your son so that he would bring light into a dark world to a dark world, that he would bring freedom where there is bondage and slavery, where he would bring peace in the middle of turmoil, and that he would bring joy 
instead of sorrow and hopelessness. And in the days to come, Lord, as we head into the Christmas season, I pray that you would help each one of us to, to experience these aspects of why Jesus came. Help us, Lord, in those moments when we feel the darkness creeping in to realize that, that even the smallest light dispels all darkness. And thank you for the light that you bring at Christmas. I pray, Lord, that we would always turn towards that light. Thank you, Lord, that you bring freedom. And that we, when we are tempted to take back onto our shoulders the yoke of slavery, when we're tempted to, to be drawn back into the sin that we've left behind, I pray, Lord, that you would remind us of the freedom that you've given us in the Christ child, the freedom to live out who you created us to be. And in those moments when peace can be hard to find, when just stuff is going on all around us that just puts us in turmoil, I pray, Lord, that in the midst of it all, we'd be like those chicks under the mother bird's wing in the middle of the storm, and that we would sense your protection. We would sense your, your watching over us. We would sense your peace. And in those times when we would be tempted to, to sorrow, when we're tempted to despair, when it's hard to find something good in a day, I pray, Lord, that you would light that spark of joy within us, that you would remind us, Lord, of, of who you are and what you've given us, and that we would be just filled with a joy that is not dependent on what goes on around us, but it's dependent on you. As we approach this Christmas season, Lord, help us to live out these things more and more. I pray, Lord, that you would flood and fill all of our lives with your joy. In Jesus' name, amen.